On this edition of the Penn State Blitz, Shaka Tony is back. We're going to discuss Penn State's new wideouts coach, what's going on with Cam Brown and Robert Windsor at the Senior Bowl, and as always, we'll conclude with the Penn State mailbag. Shaka Tony, everyone in this day of social media, putting out announcements whether they're leaving, whether they're staying. Mm-hmm. Shaka Tony, Penn State's talented fourth-year defensive end. He didn't say anything. Right. The, the, uh, the deadline for the underclassmen to declare for the 2020 NFL draft at the very latest was Monday. It was, just, it was a little convoluted. I, we thought yes. it for one time, we thought it was Friday. Yep. It was actually Monday. The deadline's gone. Penn State's got two underclassmen who should go very high in Etor Gross Matos and KJ Hamler. But I really thought I thought Shaka Tony was out the door after a pretty good uh, fourth year at Penn State. It turns out he didn't say anything, but I believe he's back unless there's going to be some transfer portal news or you never know with him. But he's been a quiet kid. So maybe we shouldn't be surprised that he really said nothing. But we're assuming he's going to be the leader. Uh, of the defensive end group in 2020. Yeah, there's no doubt about it, Bob. He's always been one of those guys that teammates says he talks a lot amongst them, but when it comes to social media and media interviews, right. he doesn't really – I don't know if he doesn't like the spotlight or if he's just a quiet <laughs> kid who doesn't have – you know, doesn't say a whole lot. But, yeah, it was interesting. You can turn on the notifications for guys' tweets. So anytime I'd see Saka underscore Tony show up on my phone, I'd grab it real quick and see – if it was an update on his draft death status, and more often than not, it was a retweet of something completely yeah. unrelated yeah. to football for the last month. So was not terribly upset to turn those off yesterday. But yeah, I mean, I think we both figured he could go. He would go, uh, at least from my perspective. Yeah. I just didn't know, you know, he's a speed rusher who right. has at times struggled to keep weight on at the college level. What more will he gain by returning to school? Right. Now, I think there are, this is a pretty good defensive end class, so maybe he just looks at it as next year could be better. Maybe he'll have a bigger year. Of course, he's going to be the focal point, though, which wasn't the case this past year because Etor Gross Matos was. So be interesting the next time we get to talk to him to see what all went into that decision, maybe how close he was to leaving. But, Bob, you remember back on signing day, James Franklin said that There were some guys who had NFL grades but were deciding to stay and that they were expecting more guys to return than uh, than maybe what Mm -hmm. they had anticipated previously. And it certainly turned out that way. Yeah. And if you if you if you look at it, there were real I think in the end, we could say there was, I guess, seven guys in play when they consider who came back and who left. We mentioned Hamler. We mentioned Gross Matos. We mentioned Tony, who's back. Mm -hmm. But this really started right around the time of the All Big Ten selection show and when the teams were announced, Etor Gross Matos yeah. immediately announced he was foregoing his last year of eligibility. Michael Mennett, Penn State's talented center, who mm-hmm. was a redshirt junior in last fall, came out and said he was going to come back. Pat Fryermuth, Penn State's uber-talented tight end, who was only in his second year, but because of uh, his prep development, and he had, he had like an extra year, I think, and yep. on, on the prep level. He was actually eligible to leave for the draft, decided to stay. Will Fries, who I didn't really anticipate going, but also could have left. He decided to stay. And another starter, Tariq Castro, feels later after the bowl game, uh, decided to stay rather than come out after kind of a little bit of, I thought, a fade at the stretch. So really seven guys, only two leave. I think it's – I'm very surprised the number wasn't higher. Yeah, me too. And I guess you could probably have thrown Lamont Wade into that group yeah. as well. Even though, again, like Castro Fields and like Fries, it was probably always very unlikely that he yeah. would leave. He still had to think about it, I'm sure. So, yeah, it's interesting. And then you move on to the, the portal, which has been very quiet this offseason so far. Um, Hunter Kelly, backup offensive lineman, jumped in there, as did uh, you know Daniel Joseph reportedly earlier this week. The thing with Joseph was I think he probably just looked at the depth chart and said Adisa Isaac and yeah. Jason Owe both played more than I did last year. They're both back. Shaka's back. Yeah. Where are my snaps going to come from? So that one makes plenty of sense. And, you know, I, I assume he'll be the last end of the transfer. Maybe not. But – you know, there's a couple yeah. positions that when you look at how it all breaks down, you could see some guys maybe after spring practice saying, okay, right. I didn't get the snaps I thought I was going to get or the coaches don't see me playing as much as I think I'm going to. So 
I do wonder if during and at the end of spring practice, we might see some more guys end up leaving. Yeah, the transfer portal really is like a Vegas casino. It's always open. Like, yeah. You just never know when someone's going to walk through that door. Justin Shorter obviously kickstarted Penn State's transfer portal. And still hasn't presence, ended up anywhere, yeah. Uh, in the, towards the end of the regular season. But, yeah, he's still, I guess, examining his uh, options. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just very confused by that, and we're probably a little bit off topic here. But how, how does a guy end up in the portal the week before the regular season ends yeah. and then doesn't end up at a school for the start of the spring semester? Isn't that the whole point of going in that early? So, you know, the question came up, and we're going to talk about him in a minute, but could Taylor Stubblefield – uh, possibly sway Justin Shorter back to Penn State. To me, if a guy goes in the portal, Bob, a week before the regular season ends, there's more at play yeah. than his position coach and whether that change or even an offensive quarter, coordinator change when it comes to Kirk Soraka. There's more at play than, than that. So I, I still can't envision him yeah. coming back. Greg, that's a great segue. You mentioned Taylor Stubblefield, Penn State's new wideouts coach, replacing Jarrett Parker, who took the West Virginia OC job. Uh, Stubblefield was a very good college wideout. He's he's actually had a couple of stops, I think, on the coaching level. Oh, just a few, yeah. Just a few. Mm-hmm. He doesn't seem to stay. He doesn't seem to stay anywhere very long. But uh, what's your early read on Stubblefield joining James Franklin's staff? What do you think his strength will be? Hopefully, we'll be getting them to catch passes rather than drop them. Well, you know, I don't know if we can go too much further. I don't know if you saw it this morning, but he made his first recruiting stop in Texas to see Parker Washington, the four-star receiver signee yesterday, which would have been Tuesday, and he was wearing a Miami belt buckle. So that has not gone over all that well. Um, I'm hopeful that he'll make light of the situation here at some point, but uh, Penn State fans don't miss anything, Bob, and they did not miss that. So um, That might might, might explain why he doesn't doesn't stay in one place very long. Yeah, right. I mean, so, yeah, a guy's been pretty much all over the country over the course of his coaching career, which started in 2007. Illinois State and Air Force, the only places he's been for more than a year. He's been in the CFL. I guess the one thing that jumps out at me is that you know, Penn State's gone the recruiter route, I think, with Jared Parker, with uh, Josh Gaddis. And, you know, it's just it's interesting now that they don't have a guy that's necessarily known as a renowned recruiter. I'm sure he's good at it. Most yeah. college coaches are. But he's more of a teacher, I think. And, it, and obviously he practiced what he's now preaching. And that's something I don't know if Penn State's necessarily had at this spot over the last few years. So, you know, I don't know. Um, it, it's It's hard to analyze, I think what he's been credited for over the course of his career just because he leaves so often. And, you know, I think it was easy to blame David Corley for some things when that year didn't go well. But, you know, you stop and think about it and how much of it was not being there long enough to make an impact versus bad habits from before versus maybe he wasn't a good coach. We just don't know the answer to that. So, yeah, it's. uh, I don't think you can ever go wrong with having a consensus All-American on your staff and a guy that knows what he's talking about. But – At the same time, you know, this is a receivers group that now has to hear a second, if not third, message in as as many years, depending on how old the guy is. Any chance we're overthinking this, and it could be as simple as Parker left late. They needed somebody for this year. Not a lot of great options. Going from Miami to Penn State, definitely maybe an upgrade for him. We'll see how he does for a year and go from there. Any chance it was just maybe them getting caught shorthanded and not seeing Parker leaving? Um, I, well, I've, I'm, I would be hard-pressed to think that they saw Parker go in the West Virginia yeah. to be the offensive coordinator. Right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they did envision that. But to me, that would be a big problem because we are, the Penn State already did this once where they hired, they you know, yeah, Corley. They and I, they couldn't pass on J1 Sider at that point yeah. in time. It's been obviously very clear how important he is to the program, how good of a recruiter he is. It makes total sense. But, you know – they went this route already once with a guy that no one's ever heard of in David Corley. And and let's be honest. I mean, the only reason, you know, Taylor Stubblefield's name is because of what he did at Purdue. Does anyone know anything about him as a coach? Not really. So uh, James Franklin, I guess better be right on this one because I don't know if they can afford another year of receiver play. It's a little bit inconsistent guys that can't get open guys that drop passes. So, you know, could that be the case, Bob? Yeah, certainly. But to me, I think they need a little bit more. They needed to look for a little bit more than that if that was the end game. Okay. Halfway through this Penn State Blitz, you know what you got to do. That's right. It's time to like, rate, and subscribe to the Penn State Blitz podcast on your favorite audio platform, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you find it. Uh, you can find us every Thursday 
If you subscribe, you'll get it early. So don't forget to do that. And if you're watching the Blitz on YouTube, it's youtube.com slash State. Okay, let's move on to some former Lions who are in some postseason games yeah. trying to improve their stock for the 2020 NFL Draft. Before, though, a little bit of a curveball for you, Greg. Before we get mm-hmm. to Cam Brown and Robert Windsor, how about Dan Chisena yeah. turning some heads in? Is it that NFL PA? It's one of those one lower level in, yes. games. No, it wasn't. I apologize was that that's else. not the name of it, but he was. The, I think he was the most outstanding player, or if not the most outstanding player, one of the standouts. Yep. Um, impressed some people because he can do some things. He's got speed. He's yeah. got size as a wideout. He's obviously could be a very effective special teams player. Mm-hmm. Um, this is kind of the route where Troy Apke kind of made a name for himself yeah. uh, a couple of years ago. And then he wowed him at the Combine, he, including Deion Sanders, ended up being a fairly high pick of the, of the Redskins. Yeah. Before we get to Cam and Robert Windsor, is there any chance Dan Chisena is really kind of making a push for maybe either a Combine invite or possibly a late spot? In the NFL draft. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it is in I, – I, first of all, I think there's probably too many pre-NFL draft all-star games. we got to look up the name of this I game. want to say it's a spiral bowl or something like that. Yeah, I've never heard of it, but clearly he impressed. He had a couple long catches. Um, yeah. You know, the speed's never been an issue. He beat guys at Penn State, but, you know, how many times did it go right through his hands and off his face mask? At least once or twice that I can think of. Yeah. And he didn't receive that many opportunities to run down the field and beat guys. So, um, but, you know, NFL teams are always going to be wowed by speed and guys that can run themselves open. So, if he's doing that at these, uh, you know, in an all-star game, he's going to have a chance to impress somebody in a training camp at bare minimum. So, yeah, we'll see. I saw Jan Johnson's going to the Hula Bowl, so never heard of that either. But he'll play well, in that. Well, the Hula Bowl used to be from way back. It used to be a great game. I think they brought it back, but at a much lower level. Right. So, I mean, <clears throat> at this point, I guess John Reed played in the NFL PA Bowl that's over the, the weekend. That's the Penn Stater in the NFL PA game. Yeah. Up. Don't know how he did, but he played in it. Um, and then, yeah, you have the Senior Bowl this week where Cam Brown and Robert Windsor get the chance to yeah. perform in front of NFL scouts. I think – Windsor is what he is in terms of he just has to showcase some of the strengths that he mm-hmm. that he played with at Penn State. For Cam Brown, though, Bob, I think NFL teams are probably wondering where exactly am I going to play this guy if I draft him. <clears throat> have to think a little bit about next year at this time. With We've already talked about five guys that made their decision mm-hmm. to come back. So that's five right there that are probably going to be in the mix for some all-star games. Yeah. Um, and there's probably some guys that are that, – that weren't eligible this year that are probably going to think about Mm -hmm. leaving. It could be a real interesting, uh, I think, 2021 draft, including Mr. Micah Parsons, but also some other players, a running back by the name of Journey Brown. It could be a really, really, really busy postseason, don't you think, Greg, for Penn State, given the amount of players they could have drafted in 2021? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, to start to ride them off, the, the, the guys that returned, obviously, we would expect all of them to leave. Some of them will have to. Some of them, like Pat Fryermuth, will have a choice to make. But, mm-hmm. you know, you have them. You obviously have, uh, you know, Journey Brown, as you said. Noah Kane will be able to make a decision at that point, as will uh, you know, Ricky Slade and Devin Ford. Uh, then you'll have, uh, you know, Jahan Dotson will be able to make a decision yeah. at that point. I mean, we could go on and on and on. But, you know, it, yeah, it's going to be impressive to see just how many of these guys end up, uh, you know, at this right. at, in these conversations at this time next year. Yeah, I was thinking about both guards. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, Rasheed Walker, too, you could throw in that conversation. Yeah, both guards, uh, Mike Miranda, C.J. Thorpe, P.J. Mustafer even, mm-hmm. Shelton maybe. Um just a just a point of clarification. Noah Kane will be a true sophomore next year, as will Devin. Ford. Oh yeah, that's right. So I, I'm not I'm not throwing you under the bus. No, I, I didn't, no, no, I just, I just good, didn't yeah. want somebody coming after you on social media to say pickle, get it together. Well, when you like, rate, and subscribe, you can also <laughs> leave a comment. So we we'll take all forms yeah. of feedback. My point was, it should yes. be it's going to be Correct. even busier at this time next year, and who knows, you know how Micah Parsons' uh, t- 2020 season is going to play out, yep. but. If he can, if he can develop, stay out of trouble. I'm just going to say that generally, stay out of trouble. He's going to be the apple of a lot of teams' eyes. Mm-hmm. I think with with the draft and maybe some workouts and the combine, him and the combine could be pretty pretty interesting. Um, okay, so let's move on to the mailbag. We've, we we didn't really talk about Cam Brown, but we talked enough about Cam Brown. He's a big guy that they don't we don't really know 
what his best position is. Yep. Oddly shaped, 6'5", 230. I'm not sure how that plays out on the NFL level. Mm-hmm. But very much an athlete, a special teams player, and I'm sure they're going to be looking at him hard at the senior bowl. But let's get to the mailbag, Greg. If you could have spent the first 60 hours of the year at a red light and then never had to sit at the red light again, would you have done it? <laughs> so our buddy Chris Hopkins came up with this this morning. I'm not sure where it came <laughs> oh, from. Oh, now I got you. I thought it was, you were referring to something in my past. No. It's just a standard question. Yes. S- yeah. The, just the first 60 hours. Right. So okay. according to the some. The first two and a half days. Right. According to some website somewhere, the average Then you person, never have to yeah, stay at a red light. Yeah. We don't, I'm not really sure how that would work, but we, just assume it would. Yeah. Well, I mean, January 1st is a big bowl game day. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Usually there's a little reverie involved, so I don't know that I would have held up very well. Okay, just sitting at a red light, but in in a vacuum, if there was nothing else going on, and I just had to punch the clock. Yep, I think I probably would have done it because right. it, it is a little ma- just to stay out of traffic in general. Yes, I, I would sit in a traffic jam. I think for sixty hours. So according if to I AAA, never had have- to sit in a traffic jam for the rest of the year. According to Triple A, you'd have to do that for 11 days cuz that's about the uh, amount of hours that people spend in traffic a year. So it's the worst. Amount of hours. Yeah. I'm just thinking about Penn State games, man. Yeah. Well, we've, yeah, that's true. We've you, gotten we gotten stuck. Used, you spend almost a whole day just sitting on Atherton to get yeah. into the, the do West Lots. Do you remember how close we came to hitting that deer in the dark on the back way home? I do. That was another problem. It yeah. was some great driving by me because yeah. I knew. And he just loped there. Yep. He was in no rush. Looked right at me. He was about 7,000 pounds and there was a car behind us. That would have been it. No cell phone reception. Nope. They, they would just be discovering our bodies right now. That's right. Yeah, we right, would have so just thought out. All right. Back kudos to, the to me for that. Anyway, yes. great mailbag question. Back, I told you you couldn't throw me. That's right. Back to the Penn State uh, side of things. Uh, at some point, they will introduce officially Phil Trout, a new offensive line coach. Yep. Uh, Taylor Stubblefield, the new receivers coach. And, of course, Kirk Shiraka, the new offensive mm-hmm. coordinator. Which one do you want to ask a question to first? And what would that question be? I think the OC, just his vision of of uh, the RPO, what he thought set it apart from a lot of RPOs when he was at Minnesota with, he did have some good talent. Those, yeah. those two receivers can play, but the way that it was just kind of choreographed, synced up, he made a really good quarterback out of Tanner Morgan. Yeah. What in his mind is the, is the are the first two real big secrets to running a successful RPO because the RPO that the Penn State defense saw in that game, I didn't, I thought it was the, a better version of even the Ohio state one. Cause the Ohio state one was essentially Justin Fields, you right. know, making plays with his feet mm-hmm. when the play wasn't there. But Tanner Morgan and that Minnesota RPO, he didn't really run the ball. That was just that good. So it, for me, it's him, um, I think the offensive line coach is a little interesting uh, too. Yeah. And if I do get a chance to talk to Taylor Stubblefield, I'll, I'll ask him about the Miami belt buckle. Good idea. Good thinking. Yeah. My first question I think would be to Troutwine, the offensive yeah. line coach. And I would just be curious to know, kind of in the same vein that you just discussed, how does what he teaches the offensive lineman mesh with what Kirk Shiraka wants the entire yeah. offense to do? Cause we've seen it. If you can't block it, and if the offensive line is not in, you know, in sync with the rest of the offense and with the quarterback, you can have guys open all you want, but it doesn't mean your quarterback's going to have time to find them. And a big part of Kirk Sharaka's offense is receivers being efficient, getting open, catching the ball, and then running through space. And sometimes that takes time to open up. We saw Minnesota a lot of the times was able to block for Tanner Morgan just long enough for him to make a quick read and get it off. What does Phil Troutwine teach that made him the right guy to pair with Kirk Sharaka. That's what I'd be curious to know. Uh, my question for you is twofold. Um, James Franklin always talks about, especially on the offensive side, making the she- scheme. I would say sheen. It could be yes. sheen or scheme. Or sheen. Or like Charlie. Sheen, Martin Sheen. Yeah. Sh- getting the scheme to fit the talent. Yeah. It's a, he says it every year. But they never really say that on the defensive side. So my question to you, Greg, is – if that's really what you're trying to do on both sides of the ball, would you consider with who they have at linebacker mm-hmm. going to a 3-4? Because you have Lance Dixon, yeah. Brandon Smith, Micah Parsons, and Ellis Brooks, who right. I think could be a pretty good linebacker inside. Is that some variation, some concoction to try and get all those guys on the field at the same time? Would you do it? Yeah, Luketa, I think, could be in that conversation, yeah, correct. too. Sorry, Jesse. I would absolutely consider it at times. I mean, I think against some Big Ten teams, it would make more sense than others. And I know that you, it gets a little messy when you're trying to go 4-3 and nickel one game and then 3-4. Yeah. But, you know, at some point, 
to throw, and we've seen them at times th- to put just three guys down at the line of scrimmage, and not often, but they have yeah. done it. But to me, yeah, anything you can do to get that many, all those good linebackers on the field Speed. as possible. Yep. And give your, even if you're going to, you know, I think it could help your secondary out with the pass rush. It would give you more speed on the field at the middle of the field. Yeah, I don't, I I don't think Brent Pry uh, could go this whole offseason, not at least tinker with that idea a little bit. And I think too, with the back end, they have to figure out and diagnose why, what's happening that a lot of times, at least in 2019, guys were late to show up for help from the safety position. And the corners just never turned around more often than not to find the ball and play it. You know, that's yeah. two things that they really have to take a deep dive on and see what happened there. The bend but don't break philosophy is great when it works. But if you break too many times, you're not going to be able to stay in it with the best teams. I think you and I should start banging a drum for the Penn State 3-4 right now. Get it, get it out in front of everyone else. Let's do it. And just see see how it plays out. They're not particularly blessed at defensive tackle. Yeah, they don't have a defensive end like Etor Gross Mattis who can kick inside on some plays and play inside. I don't think Owe is that guy. Mm-hmm. Shock is not that guy. Right. I don't think Adisa Isaac's that guy. Right. Just saying, not a bad idea. The strength Bob. is the linebacker group. Wouldn't you try and Mike is essentially he can do whatever he wants. Like, right. He's big enough to play defensive. I just think, I think it's a no brainer. But I don't. It's, it's very rare that James Franklin listens to you or I. So. That's right. There's always a first time.